Now hear the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. If you would like to follow along, I'll be reading from the NIV version. This is the word of the Lord. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and go on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us and have borne, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, friends. It's just a delight to be here. On Tuesday afternoon, I was driving back from Columbia, South Carolina, where I was working with the church, and uh, all of a sudden, my Bluetooth-connected cell phone rang, and on the other end was Lynn Hendricks, who's the pastor of the Covenant Presbyterian Church in Tullahoma. And uh, Lynn was kind enough to call me to invite me to their 30th uh, anniversary as a church uh, this today in Tullahoma, and uh, he said, you were here 25, uh, for the 25th anniversary five years ago, and we'd like to have you come back to be our special guest. And I says, well, uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to be there because I'm going to be at Christ Community Church on Sunday preaching for David Cassidy so he can be with you uh, for your 30th anniversary on Sunday. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm taking David's place, and he, was, uh, he thought that was humorous. I realized that I could never adequately stand in for your good pastor. And, uh, and for those of you who are visiting, expecting to uh, be able to hear uh, Pastor Cassidy today, I apologize and urge you to come back next Sunday. You'll hear a real good sermon, I, I guarantee you. And uh, I told the first uh, congregation this morning at the first service that <clears throat> uh, about a, a supply preacher who was filling in for us, a pastor who was ill, and he stood and said to the congregation, I'm standing in for your pastor this morning. He's not well. I understand I could never fully take his place. As a matter of fact, I feel like I'm kind of like the pillow that you pick up to fill into a broken window pane, you know, until you can get the new pane, the uh, pillow will do just to keep the cold, uh, cold weather out. And, um, and so after the sermon was over, he was standing at the door greeting folks as he left. And this one dear lady came by and said to him, Pastor, I want you to know you are not a pillow, you're a pain. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, so I'll take that. And I fully realizing that I never could quite stand in for my good friend, David Cassidy. Uh, I want to tell you how honored I was that he would call me and ask me to to stand in for him today, and also it's an opportunity for me to tell you how thrilled I am at what I sense to be a fresh wind of God's Spirit moving here at Christ Community, and I uh, delight in all that's going on, the way the church is growing, 
for the uh, uh, sense of excitement, the electricity that's in the air. And uh, uh, all of us in the presbytery are thrilled that uh, uh, the way this church is progressing uh, these days. Now, before we begin, I want us to turn our hearts again to the Lord to ask uh, God to uh, speak to our hearts and to uh, give us insight and understanding into His Word as we reflect together on this passage of Scripture that was read. Would you join me? <clears throat> we thank You, our Heavenly Father, for Your Word of truth. We recognize that it is without error, that it was given by the Holy Spirit Himself who inspired holy men that you appointed and raised up to be your servants. And so now we ask you, Holy Spirit, the author of this book, uh, to give us insight and understanding. And then we ask you that you would show us how it applies to our lives. Encourage us, Father, by the truth that's here uh, concerning your love and grace and mercy extended toward us. So give us grace, Lord, to pull the curtains that would separate us from the world in which we live so that we wouldn't be distracted and could focus our attention totally upon you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In preparation for the sermon, I uh, read uh, a sermon on exposition that was written by uh, someone you may know named Bill Brownson. Uh, Bill, I think, is worshipped here on occasion. He lives in Holland, Michigan, and for 30 years was the radio voice of the Reformed Church in America in their broadcast called Words of Hope. And, uh, and so uh, <clears throat> Bill on one occasion uh, preached on this text, and in the context of the exposition, he told about how when he was uh, a junior in high school that his French teacher, uh, he was taking his third year of French, his French teacher assigned this particular passage of Scripture in French uh, for the uh, students to read and to discuss in class the following day. He had never really read that passage of Scripture before, and so he, he read it. He found it to be a very interesting passage. Uh, it seemed to him to be like uh, Jesus talking about an ordinary agricultural enterprise, uh, complete with uh, labor issues and uh, hour and wage uh, concerns, etc., and wage disputes. And... Uh, but then he came to the, uh, the last part of the passage, and he became very troubled because all of a sudden, it seems that the guy who owned this property uh, was not following good business practices. As a matter of fact, it didn't seem altogether fair. Uh, Bill even said that there was a girl named Evelyn in his class, and he remembered it distinctly, who uh, got very angry uh, at the... Uh, the storyline because this landowner who had invited and hired all of these workers were being, was being unjust, and, um, and he was violating all the good practices that uh, a good business owner should, uh, should practice and was not being fair to his laborers and so forth and so on. And so um, <clears throat> Bill said that obviously he didn't understand uh, the passage and uh, over the years has come to really appreciate the passage, and so uh, I would echo what he said, uh, because I've come to not only appreciate the passage, but it's become one of my favorite uh, of, all the, uh, of all the parables that Jesus told. Um, I picked this passage really because your pastor told me that he was in the middle of a series on the radical generosity of God. And uh, he also hinted strongly that he would appreciate my kind of continuing that series if it were all possible. And so I uh, was glad to do it, and because I love this parable so much, I went right to it, because this parable is all about God's generosity. There's not really many passages in all the New Testament that explains in such a dramatic way how generous and how radical is the, is the generosity of God. In fact, it probably illustrates better than any other passage in the New Testament a wonderful Old Testament word, hesed. 
H-E-S-E-D is the way you would write that out in English. Uh, it's uh, three Hebrew letters with some vowel marks under two of them. The word is hesed, H-E-S-E-D. It's a word that's used 250 times in the Old Testament, and it's used heavily in the book of Psalms. And it's translated in a variety of ways, the most common way that this word is translated in describing God and His attitude toward us is loving kindness. Uh, so when you are reading in the Old Testament and come to that phrase, loving kindness, probably behind it is the Hebrew word hesed. Sometimes the word is translated mercy, sometimes compassion, sometimes just love, uh, sometimes just kindness. But the most often used phrase is loving kindness, referring, of course, to God. Now, if you were to be a Greek scholar and try to take that Hebrew word and translate it into Greek, you will find it in the Greek New Testament uh, in one of two Greek words. It would be elias, the Greek word for mercy, or it would be charis, the Greek word for grace. Mercy and grace uh, are the equivalents. Nothing can quite be the exact equivalent of hesed because it's such a comprehensive, all-encompassing word about the generosity and kindness of God. Uh, a few days ago, in the providence of God, my path crossed that of Michael Card. Many of you know Michael, and uh, Michael told me that he was writing a book uh, on the word hesed. And, uh, and so we started talking about the word hesed, and he said to I said, how would you define hesed? And, and Michael said, well, you can't define hesed with just a word. You can't even define it with a, with a phrase. Hesed, he said, can best be defined in a sentence. Hesed is what a person from whom you have no right to expect anything gives to a person who's in great need. It's receiving from someone from whom you deserve nothing, everything you need in great abundance again and again and again. And, and then he said he heard somebody say one time that the word hesed is a very important word, maybe one of the most important words in all of the Bible, because it really is the one word that defines the character of God. God is a God filled with loving kindness and mercy and compassion. He's a God who enters into a covenant, and even though we might break the covenant, He continues to show kindness and love and show mercy and grace and develop plans to restore once again those who belong to Him. I go into this, uh, this little uh, description because the parable that we read this morning and look at is a good illustration of Hesed. Now, granted, um, uh, this parable is controversial. There are some theologians who feel like that it's probably not properly interpreted, and, uh, and yet I believe that God wants us to understand this passage uh, as, a, as a way of understanding something of His heart of his real attitude and relationship toward us. It's, of course, one of the many parables that Jesus uh, told during his ministry about the kingdom of God. The parable begins, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he goes on to talk about the landowner uh, who owns a vineyard, who goes out and hires laborers, and so forth and so on. And there are a lot of, uh, of those parables that he tells to illustrate the reality of the kingdom of God, which reminds us of the fact that we live in two kingdoms, those of us who are Christians. We live in the United States of America, a civil political entity uh, with policemen and, uh, and an army and, uh, and politicians, some of honest and some aren't honest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We elect people, uh, we, uh, uh, we live by laws and so forth and so on. We are subject to the justice system of the United States of America and the various levels of government that follow it. 
But we also live as citizens in the kingdom of God. And so we serve King Jesus. And so our struggle is, how can we be loyal American citizens and at the same time loyal citizens in the kingdom of God? Uh, Chuck Colson, a good many years ago before he died, wrote a wonderful book, which I hope is still in print. I commend it to you. It's more important today than ever before. He wrote a book about this called Kingdoms in Conflict. And in that book, he talks about the fact that Christians will increasingly, as our culture declines, will increasingly find themselves in conflict with the civil government of which they are a part. And that... Um, and we need to always remind ourselves that our allegiance ultimately is to Jesus and Jesus alone. And if there's ever a conflict between our allegiance to our civil government and our allegiance to Jesus, uh, then of course we must be prepared to follow Jesus, even if it brings suffering and hardship and difficulty in our lives. I suspect that my grandchildren my great-grandchildren, unless there's a, ma a massive revival in our country, will actually suffer uh, for their faith. And, uh, but in any case, I, I, I want you to be reminded that this is a kingdom parable, uh, one of several that Jesus told. And we are looking at it this morning because this parable is different from the other parables in a very significant way because it talks in a different angle about the generosity, the radical generosity of God, about the value system in the kingdom of God that is quite different from the value system of the secular world in which we live, the kingdom of this world. Now, in that regard, I just want to point out two or three things in the passage. The first thing I want you to know is that Jesus shows his generosity by taking us into his, a relationship with him to be uh, workers. He gives us a job in the kingdom. None of the other kingdom uh, parables do this. Uh, all the other kingdom parables talk about a great feast or a great party or uh, uh, a father welcoming a wayward son and, and throwing a great party for him. It, it, it talks about uh, sitting down at a table and bringing nothing but just sitting at the table and enjoying the intimacy of sitting with the king and enjoying the bounty of his table. And, uh, and we rejoice and delight in those parables because uh, that's quite different, by the way, from uh, the kingdom of this world. Uh, I, no matter how many times I call the White House, the president never calls me back. And, uh, and I, I live in a constant fear that someday somebody will lose my social security number and I'll be a nothing in this world. But there's intimacy, there's personal dimension in the kingdom of God. But this parable teaches us something else. This parable teaches us that God invites us to labor in His kingdom, to be a partner with Him in the work that He has outlined and His plan and purpose for His kingdom. Uh, for his efforts to penetrate the world and the darkness all about us with the light of the gospel. We are partners. And as I think about that, I cannot help but think about that wonderful story in the Bible of how Jesus one day was standing on a hillside teaching a great crowd of people on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. And there as he spoke to this great crowd of people, 5,000 people, uh, evidently, a lot of time had passed, and the disciples began to get very concerned as the sun began to set in the western sky. And so they came up to Jesus, and they kind of whispered into his ear, you better bring a close to this. It's time for the benediction, uh, because it's getting late in the day, and the people are hungry, and uh, you've got to get them time to get to Burger King and, and, and then get back home. And, and Jesus said to them, you feed them. You feed them. And the disciple says, man, it would, it would take the wages of, it would, it would take a, a year's wages of a person to buy enough food to feel these people. And Jesus said, go ahead and you feed them. 
And you remember the story. It's a wonderful story. One of my favorite stories of how they, they kind of surveyed the crowd, worked through the crowd, et cetera, and finally found this little boy whose mother had the presence of mind to pack him a lunch before he came. And so in that bag, a basket, were two fish and five loaves. And Andrew was the boy who, no, it was Philip, who, who, was the, uh, who found the little boy and brought him to Jesus. And uh, he says, I found this little boy, and he's got a, a sack lunch and uh, five loaves and two fish. There they are. And I'm sure that Philip was saying, <laughs> you know, that's all I could find. And Jesus took it, and he lifted it, and he prayed. And he did what none of the disciples could do or no one in the crowd could do. The food multiplied, and all 5,000 people were fed, and 12 baskets were left over. You know, that changed the disciples' lives. I'm convinced they were never the same after that. Because Jesus had taught them something very, very important. You see, working in the kingdom is nothing more than taking who you are and your gifts and your skills and doing what God has equipped you to do. It may be cooking in the kitchen. It may be raising children. It may be befriending a neighbor. It may be caring for the homeless. It may be, it may be any number of things. But you're doing what you can do, and you're bringing it to Jesus, and then you're watching Jesus take it and do amazing things that thrills your heart. And so I can imagine that night as the disciples sat around the fire uh, talking to themselves, they were still thinking about the amazing thing that God did, and all they did was to simply obey Jesus and go out, survey the crowd, and they finally found a little boy with two fish and five loaves. Well, that's, that's the joy of, of serving Jesus. That's, that's what it's all about. And so the apostle Paul, Peter, Paul, as he writes to the church at Corinth, he's addressing the issue that the church is on the verge of being divided over some following Paulus and some following um, Paul. And, and then in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, I think it's around verses 8 and 9, and that's that. He, he said, now listen, you've got to understand. I'm working in the kingdom, but my job is to, is to plant. Apollos is working in the kingdom. His job is to water. But God is the only one who can give the increase. And so we're laboring. We're working. As a matter of fact, we're all in this together. We are on Jesus' team. And we're having fun, and it's exciting. But we can't do what Jesus can do. And so the principle is Jesus lets us do what we can do, and he only does the things that we can't do. I, as most parents, have spent years and hours praying for my children. And I finally said, Lord, I'm asking for something I can't do. I can't make them a Christian. I can't make them love you. But I need wisdom to love them myself. And I need patience. And I need to be aware of the opportunities to have, have influence in their lives. But I'm counting on you to keep your covenant promise and to transform them and to give them hearts that will love you. That's my job, my work. But the critical things I can't do. I was talking to a couple after the first service, and I, and I said to them, we were talking about their children. I said, there's only three things you can do. You can, you can love them unconditionally. You can pray for them earnestly. That's all you can do. What they really need is something only God can do, you see. But isn't it wonderful to think that this gracious God trusts us and draws us into partnership with him to do kingdom work? Now, make no mistake about it. He doesn't need us. He really doesn't need us. He's all wise, all powerful. He owns everything. He spoke, and the whole universe came into existence, right? So he doesn't really need us. 
And he realizes that if we are faithful in working, we might somehow get a distorted feeling that we are earning his favor and his, his, his blessing and we may be earning our right to go to heaven. But that's not in the picture at all. It's simply his generous attitude of drawing us into a partnership with him and saying, what I've equipped you to do, I want you to do. For my glory and for the sake of the kingdom. And then what you can't do, I'll do. That's generosity. That's trusting us. That's showing us great respect. That's an expression of his love. Then I want you to notice another thing in this, uh, in this passage. Oh, by the way, we never retire. I, I, I'm in my early 80s, 81 to be exact. And I think one of the greatest blessings in my life is that I get up every morning with something to do. I mean, something meaningful to do. Letters to write, phone calls to make, places to go, meetings to attend, plans to develop, uh, trips to make. And for me, the most boring existence would be to get up every morning and go to the golf course or to figure out another hobby to develop to occupy my time. God doesn't mean for us to retire, dear friends. We redeploy. We redeploy. And as we get older, we might gear down because our bodies are wearing out, et cetera, but we, we never retire. I had a dear lady in the previous pastor I served, uh, church I served in uh, South Alabama, who was 95 years old, wonderful, wonderful lady, Miss Sally, we called her. She was the founder of the Department of Family and Children's Services in that county. And she was greatly loved and greatly esteemed. And now she was 95 years old, living alone, right on Main Street there in that town. And I went to see her one day, and she was moving around slowly on her walker, and she was very angry with God. And I said, Miss Sally, what's going on? She says, I don't understand why God doesn't take me to heaven. Herman went to heaven 10 years ago, and I'm so lonely. I want to go to heaven. That was her husband. And I said, Miss Sally, we work on God's time, not yours. When it's time for you to go to heaven, God will take you. But in the meantime, you've got to reorient yourself to figure out how you should be serving God. And we started making an inventory. I think she, she did and did well. She loved to read. She loved to write. She loved to knit. And before I left there, we had a plan for her, and she became a major corresponder for our church with all of our missionaries. And she would send them socks and sweaters to distribute to people that they were dealing with all over the world. And then I said, and don't forget to pray. Pray for your pastor. And every week we send out a prayer list, and you you make that your focus. And oh, four or five years later, at the age of about 100, she died, but she served Christ until she died. No retirement for the Christian. God employs us in the kingdom for the rest of our lives. But also, I want to say to you that God shows us his hesed, his radical love, by giving us all great value. Uh, did you realize that Billy Graham, in the eyes of God, is no more valuable or precious to God than the man who washes dishes or cooks food at the rescue mission? Uh, did you realize that the pastor of this church is no more precious or valuable in the eyes of God than that little 80-year-old lady in the hospice facility who a month ago prayed to receive Christ and died last night. That's what this story is all about, and that's why it's so controversial, you see. Because Evelyn, my friend's classmate back in the early 40s, got angry because she didn't think the landowner was fair. The landowner paid the person who came to work at five in the afternoon and worked only an hour the same amount that he paid the person who started at six in the morning and worked a solid 12 hours. Doesn't seem fair. 
And, and you know, the landowner was so eager to see people gainfully employed and involved in his vineyard that he not only hired a group at 6 o'clock in the morning, but he went back at 9 and 12 and 3 and then 5 in the afternoon, and he kept gathering people and gathering and gathering people an expression of the growth of the kingdom. And I don't know why people kept showing up at the marketplace. Maybe, maybe they didn't show up at 6 o'clock because they weren't interested in working. Or maybe it was 9 or 12 o'clock before they showed up because they'd had a tough night the night before and had a hangover. Or maybe they just got out of prison. Or maybe they were crippled and had a hard time walking that far. But the fact of the matter is the landowner liked them all. And he, gave them, he invited them all into his, into his vineyard uh, to work. Everyone was precious. After the first service, I talked with a man who had been witnessing for a long, long time to a, a, a man who wasn't a Christian, and he said he was murdered a few years ago. And I've often wondered whether or not he was one of those people at the last minute who came to Christ maybe just before he died. And I said, you never know. You could never have made him a Christian anyway. <laughs> all you could do was to plant the seed and water it. That's all you could do. And uh, you, you never know. But I do know this, that we Christians who are quote-unquote charter members, and we've been around for a while, and we have served God for a long time, our sinful nature is such that we tend to look down on people who become Christians yesterday in prison and we are skeptical as to whether or not they really know the Lord. And we look our nose down now, look down our nose at them. Well, this story tells us that God loves the man in prison who just received Christ yesterday as much as he loves me. And gives that man the very same thing he gave me. Forgiveness. A personal relationship with him a deep sense of meaning and purpose in life, has filled that empty void in my life and has given me a reason for living and a relationship with my Creator that's personal and intimate and sweet and good and a life that's marked with joy and I know that He's given that person in prison or that person in the alcohol treatment center or the rescue mission or in Casey Holmes or in Hard Bargain, He's given that person the very same thing He's given me. We both needed it badly. So God values us all the same. Some of us have more visibility than others. Some of us have dark work. That was true in the vineyard. There were some people who were trimming the, uh, pruning the vines, others who were fertilizing, those who were pulling weeds. Some were mending fences. They were doing all kinds of things commensurate with their ability, but they were all valued and paid the same thing by the landowner. That's wonderful. One final thing, and we close. Do you notice in this story that the only person who has any wealth is the landowner? The landowner is responsible for anything that anybody else has in this story. And he gives them generously what they need, and he applauds the fact that they're in the, uh, in the vineyard and they're busy at work. Now, the question is, what will they do with what the landowner has given them? And the answer is, they are to learn by watching him the principle of generosity. Over a period of time, they would begin to get it. This man has loved me so much. He has given me so much. He has shown me so much respect. He has given me so much self-esteem and made me feel so good about myself. He has seen in me potential I've never had. He's given me a personal relationship with him. How can I ever thank him? And you don't thank him by writing him a check. You thank him by being as generous as others as he was with you. You see, it's the principle of grace giving. We love him because he first loved us. 
And we give to him because he first gave to us the greatest and most precious gift that one could ever imagine, the gift of life. And so I may be in contradiction to your pastor here, but I'm not too impressed with tithing. I'm much more impressed with grace giving. I think that there's a danger in tithing, and the danger is that legalistic feeling that once I write the check, that I've done my obligation. Listen, there are a lot of people who tithe who haven't given enough. There are a lot of people who are giving 10% who ought to be given 80 and 90% in light of the wealth that God has poured out upon them. And then probably there are a few people, very poor people, who really couldn't afford 10%. We give because we've been given to. That's the secret, I think, of understanding the generosity of God. And as we understand it and grow in it, we will find ourselves looking for the opportunity and how we might give more and more to the work of the kingdom to see others drawn into the vineyard, into the workforce, and in our relationship with God. And so as we close, I want to tell you that, as I said early on, this parable has become a very, a very, very favorite of mine. I, I love it almost as much as I love the parable of the prodigal son or the Good Samaritan story. I love it because better than any other parable, it shows us how depth, how deep and how wide and how full the generosity of God is. He comes in spite of who I am. I have no claim on him. I, I have no reason to believe or expect that he will give me anything. And yet he's a Hesed God who gives me the one who deserves it the least. Everything I need, again and again and again, ever faithful. And even when I stray, he doesn't stop. He never cuts me off. He always holds me close to himself. I made that commitment 70 years ago. And I've been up and down in my personal walk with, with God. And I've met people who only came to know Christ five, ten years ago, and I've never found one yet who gloated in the fact that he spent 40 years not knowing Christ. Most of them say, you know what? I wish I'd have gone to work at 6 o'clock this morning instead of 5 o'clock this afternoon. Because I've missed so much. I have missed opportunities to know him more intimately and deeply. I, I've missed the joy of the relationship the joy of the walk, the joy of serving. I've missed that. And there may be a few people here today who've never responded to the king's invitation. And I want to say to you, Jesus died for you. And God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And today, the Holy Spirit is here. And he extends to you the very same invitation that he extended to me 70 years ago, and that the landowner extended to the workers to come into a relationship with him, experience forgiveness, experience the Hesed generosity of our great and mighty God, and experience the joy of serving Jesus. Father, we are thankful for this wonderful story, which is so at odds with the values of the world in which we live where we measure people by their education, by their ability, by their productivity, and we esteem them based on what they've accomplished. Well, we are thankful that you've invited us into a kingdom where those values are set aside, and now we live by kingdom values and are loved in a way that the world does not understand by our God who cares deeply and has provided sacrificially through the death of His Son for everything we need, and who meets us day by day in His grace and mercy. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, it was a 
full morning, but a beautiful service. Um, as I see the kids come in during the offering, I think that's exactly how we should run to these tables. And that's what you've done this morning. Um, will you stand and receive the Lord's benediction? We have a closing song. Lift your hearts and hands and receive the Lord's benediction. May the love of God the Father and the grace of Jesus Christ and the comforting presence of God the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.